Thank you, Dr. Whitaker. Thank you, Dr. Whitaker. Some wonderful takeaways, again, from all of our experts. So now is our chance to mine these minds, if you will. And so I'll ask all of our guest presenters to come back up on stage for our panel discussion. And again, we'd like to encourage you to join the discussion and ask some questions of our experts. Again, they're happy to field any general questions that you might have. But again, we want to reiterate that they are unable to offer specific personal medical advice. So for those of us that are here, um, if you just want to put up your hand and one of our student volunteers will come by with the microphone and ask the question. For our virtual participants, we have a volunteer in the audience who will relay your questions as well. And I'm just going to actually start just quickly because we just heard Dr. Whitaker and with the knee injuries, is there, I was thinking, is there one particular, is there like some that are worse than others that lead to osteoarthritis when it comes to those injuries? Yeah, there, there definitely are. Um, and I don't want to get into the anatomy too much, but if you have a fracture that involves the joint, that's a, a big risk factor for osteoarthritis. Um, if you tear one of the main ligaments in the middle of your knee called your anterior cruciate ligament, it's oh, yeah. also a, a, a big risk factor, particularly if it's combined with a tear of your meniscus. And then if you do something that sort of um, impacts the cartilage, the covering of the bone, and you get a, a lesion or a defect, those three are, are probably the three injuries that are associated with the highest risk. Of okay, yes. We, ACLs, ACLs are, so are a pandemic, and we've probably they? Sadly, <laughs> all heard about that. Yeah. Yes, it's, and especially in, in youth sports. Okay, I guess we'll take one from, yes, let's go. We'll start in-house, as it were, and then we'll uh, hope to take a question from our virtual audience. Hi. Um, my question is in regards to the fermented foods. Are there milk alternatives to yogurt and uh, is it kefir or kefir? Yes, so we do have um, an increasing number of plant-based options. Um, so dairy, traditionally, uh, lots of milk products. Um, yogurt, obviously, made from cow's milk but there are starting to be some options um, from plant proteins. So you might, if you go into the dairy section, uh, that's where they'll be found and you could find um, some options that are, it, it's a small component still, but there are some options for those who cannot or maybe don't want to consume the dairy, the fermented dairy. Yeah. Okay, another from our, um, San Terry, do you have one from our virtual audience? I do. Thank Excellent. you so much to all the presenters. We have a very engaged online audience, so I'm going to relay a couple of questions to you. Um, first, a little bit about some in finger joints. So, is finger pain in the morning likely arthritis? And further to that, can fingers that are crooked from arthritis be made straight with physiotherapy or other treatment? Dr. Worley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the small joints of the hand are commonly affected with osteoarthritis. People can develop little bumps called Heberden's nodes, which are just bone spurs. Uh, they're synovial joints, so you can get arthritis in those joints just like you can in your hip or your knee. Uh, hand therapy and therapy can certainly help that. Um, there are, uh, it's rare that we operate on those things because of the nature of the disease and the fact that it can uh, improve with uh, conservative treatment. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving a little bit more into the diet side of things, with regards to probiotics, prebiotics, there's so many out there. How can somebody know which one is good for them? You did refer a little bit to this. Um, another specifically had a doctor mention recommending Metamucil and wondering if that type would, uh, fiber would have the same benefits for gut health. Yeah, no, it, it's such a common question, and as consumers, uh, there's lots of different supplements out there, and so how do we know which ones work and which ones don't? And that's why the um, guidelines that I referred to there, so if you, if you want to look that up afterwards, if you just go to that ISAPP, I-S-A-P-P, -P, and go to that website, it's for clinicians, it's for consumers, and it has an entire list of all of the various supplements um, and food products. So I'll just put one example out there. Uh, so it's meaningful. So in yogurts, Activia is a, a probiotic containing yogurt. So it lists all of them there and it gives the scientific evidence for whether or not this um, product actually has um, evidence to, to 
manage a particular condition. And then you'll also see in there that it's not all conditions. So there's, there's lots of them that are targeted towards different types of diarrhea, for example, uh, or constipation. Um, some uh, new ones are emerging that uh, affect mood, so anxiety and very mild anxiety and depression. So it really is a very valuable guide um, for us as consumers to have some bit of reassurance to know whether or not this uh, supplement could actually have a benefit. So I really encourage you to, to look at that if you're uh, considering taking a, a probiotic supplement. Um, and as far as prebiotics, we have less prebiotic supplements available to us as consumers compared to probiotics, which, which are really widespread and lots of them. But um, definitely uh, the regular fiber supplements, so there was the mention of Metamucil. Um, there's also a Benefiber, which is a, a actual prebiotic fiber. So there are, uh, again, in the fiber section, the fiber supplement section is where you would normally find those um, uh, supplements to assist. Yep. Thank you, that sounds like great resources. I will pass it back to the room. Oh, hi there, my name's Wayne Chang. I'm actually a primary care provider. I have two quick questions. Um, I, I'm a true believer of exercise as medicine, and I agree it needs to be a proper dose. Um, my question uh, to my learned colleague from Dr. Whitaker from UBC is, um, how do I motivate my patients to exercise? Because I really struggle with that. Yeah, it's a <laughs> great question, and I think, I think I would spin it around, and it's more, how do you get them to motivate themselves? So you have to figure out what it is that, that they're passionate about that they want to do. Maybe something that they can no longer do that they used to do that's really important to who they are, and use that either as the carrot or use sort of a, a, a pre-version of that activity to slowly getting them more engaged in activity. So really, I think it's about identifying what's important to a person and working with them to do that thing even if we don't agree that that thing might be the best thing. So, you know, for instance, maybe um, they're somebody who does an activity that you think, oh, I'm not sure that's really the best thing that you should be doing right now. If that's actually the thing that gets them started and be starting to become more physically active and arranging their lifestyle to be more physically active, you can start there. If they start to have flare-ups and start to have problems, then you can have that conversation around, well, maybe we need to modify it or we need to do this a little bit differently, but they've already started to lay down a lot of the really positive habits they need to be physically active. So I think it really, you gotta figure out what really resonates with them and what's important to them. Thank you, and for Dr. Reimer, I have a number of Asian patients in my practice, mm -hmm. and um, are there examples of fermented food uh, such as kimchi, would, you, mm. would that be considered a, uh, a food rich in bacteria, that, of the good bacteria? And I want to know if there's a list somewhere where I could mm. consult. Yes, so absolutely, fermented foods, and uh, we typically give an example of kimchi. I didn't know if this audience, uh, you know, some may know what kimchi is. It's, it's a fermented uh, cabbage from the Korean culture. Um, the one thing with fermented foods is that they are best when they are not pasteurized. So there is some impact of the way those fermented foods, like sauerkraut, kimchi, some of the, well, the, the dairy drinks are, are, are okay because we don't typically pasteurize after we put those bacteria in. But um, yes, so getting more bacteria into um, just from the foods we eat is very important. And again, resource. Um, and again, I have to direct you to that International Scientific Association of Probiotics and Prebiotics, so ISAP. Uh, it is just a phenomenal resource for all things related to probiotics, prebiotics, and fermented foods. And they have um, published a very, very good resource for us, a paper, that talks about what are the fermented foods, which ones actually would give a health benefit um, to the individual when they consume them. So um, I would encourage anybody who's interested in you know, eating more fermented foods uh, to look at that resource again. Because we used to get a lot more bacteria 
in the foods we ate, uh, so we got just more bacterial exposure, which was a good thing, but we've, you know, pasteurized, sterilized, processed, and we just really don't get the food bacteria load that we used to, so getting more of those traditionally fermented foods into our diet is, is very good for our happy gut. My question is about vitamin D and bone health. I was part of a three-year double-blind study on um, bone health and vitamin D with Dr. David Hanley. So is vitamin D currently uh, considered important for bone health? What's the dosage? And should it be synthetic or from a food source, like, say, cod liver oil or something like that? Doctors? Who would like to handle this Dr. question? Boyd? <laughs> Dr. Boyd. Let me nominate Dr. Boyd, who's in the audience. Dr. Boyd. <laughs> Dr. Boyd needs a microphone. There we go. Okay. I can just quickly comment um, because I was part of that study with Dr. Hanley, and, and ironically, we have the entire vitamin D study uh, team. Right oh, here. very nice. So. <laughs> so um, I'm not going to comment on the medical side of it. I'm going to be very careful about that. Um, because I am a biomedical engineer, and that's where Dr. Hanley really comes in. But I will say um, the message of that study, the major message of that study, was to take adequate vitamin D, follow the Osteoporosis Canada guidelines. Those are excellent. Taking more vitamin D, and, and what we were studying in that study was very high doses, doesn't seem to be beneficial, and to a small extent actually could be uh, detrimental to bone. So taking enough is very important. So I'll leave that with that message. That sounds like a good question for Dr. Reimer. Uh, I, most of the vitamin D that you'll find uh, available for us as consumers, uh, that form is, is exactly fine for us to take. Yep, yep. Um, you hit on cortisone shots. What's the benefit of it and what's the drawback? Hmm. Yeah, so I'll take that one. Um, Really, cortisone is a potent anti-inflammatory medication. When it's injected into a joint, it doesn't have systemic side effects, side effects like taking a pill form. So the pill form is prednisone. People are on prednisone for various uh, conditions. But when you inject it into the joint, um, it doesn't have negative side effects. When you take it systemically, it can affect blood sugars, can affect weight gain. It has lots of negative side effects, including uh, osteoporosis. When you inject it into the joint, it just provides a uh, anti-inflammatory effect that's very potent, but is very self-limited. It'll only last for two to three months, and usually that effect wears off. Um, there's not a lot, of, there's controversy over whether it causes harm to the joint itself. Um, and I think that if you use it fewer than three to four times a year, you're unlikely to cause harm. Um, but eventually the effect usually is limited and you have to go on to other treatments. Another one from in-house. And Terry, just let me know if we've got some virtual questions as well. Hi there. This is a question about um, knee surgery. Just wondering uh, what the thoughts are on minimally invasive knee surgery where they don't cut, you know, the, the tendon and so on above the knee. Yeah, so there's lots of uh, opportunity for continued research in, in uh, changing how we do knee replacement surgery, but the reality is you still have to put a reliable implant in and get fixation to the bone for long-term success. A lot of the joints we put in today should last more than 20 years, and if it's cemented and in good position, uh, it should last that long. Um, the, the, the challenge is we always have this concept that uh, something put in uh, less invasively or through a smaller incision is better. The reality in implant surgery is you have to be able to put the implant in the correct position and not compromise that. So if the vision is compromised, if you're uh, making compromises in, in, uh, in how you do the procedure, there's other risks to that. And the main thing would be putting the implant in the wrong position, which impacts where and then the longevity of that implant. And just a quick follow-up, because I have two parents who've had a couple of uh, replacements. It's really that post is so important, isn't it? After, I mean, there's the surgery, and I think sometimes people think that that's... I know for my father, he just feels, oh, I can now just sit more. But he really can't. My mom is the complete opposite. She really got to her exercises. Could yep. you just speak to yep. the imperative, you know, how important that Absolutely. is post-op? 
Yeah, the, yeah. the post-op rehabilitation is, is critical and it's often guided by physiotherapists and by the, the surgical team and uh, nurses. It's really important that uh, you follow those protocols, particularly in the first few months after a knee replacement surgery. We're also through the Strategic Clinical Network looking at prehabilitation and, and uh, a new program mm -hmm. which we hope to receive funding and, and develop is to offer this province-wide to patients who are uh, contemplating surgery to make sure that their range of motion, their strength is optimized because oh. there's good evidence that if you're well prepared for surgery, your outcome will be improved as well. Oh, good. Excellent. Okay. We've got another one from back of the room. Yes, yeah, just for Dr. Reimer. Um, is there any kind of rule of thumb for how long it takes your microbiome to repair itself if you've been using, um, say, anti-inflammatories or other antibiotics for treating the pain or the inflammation and those sorts of things in the joint injuries? So what we know about the microbiome is it can shift very rapidly. So there have been research studies where they drastically changed uh, an individual, and this was with diet, and they could show that within 24 hours you can have a, a, a big turnover and a change in the, the composition, the profile of that individual. Now with antibiotics, um, there's two key areas of life. So if those antibiotics are taken very early in life, so in infancy, we see that the impact on that microbiome is much larger and longer lasting. So that can uh, have an impact many, many years uh, into the future and can impact disease risk, so things like asthma. Um, what they see with the microbiome in, in adulthood when that microbiome has stabilized itself. So that occurs, you know, right when we're around three years of age, it, it stabilizes and becomes more adult-like already. Um, that impact of the antibiotics is less. It doesn't mean that for every individual they will come completely back to what their uh, microbiome looked like before, but for many individuals, it will return. Uh, it could be weeks for it to return, sometimes months. Um, but in adulthood, the impact of those antibiotics does seem to be quite a bit less than if those antibiotics are taken and experienced very early in life when that microbiome is trying to establish itself. I have a question about exercise in uh, more in the community situation, um, being a senior and uh, without a car and being told I should be swimming more. And what uh, has there ever been thought of having a shuttle situation, for example, directly from seniors' places to recreation centers? Because obviously if we have to stand out in the cold waiting for a bus, this is not helpful. <laughs> I'm not sure who should answer that. I think there's great logic in what you've just yes. said. And I think that I'm, I looked at you just because of your position with the bone and joint SEN. I mean, I think that these, are, these suggestions are wonderful suggestions. And I think obviously living also in a province like Alberta, where, you know, it's challenging to go out for a few months out of the year. Um, we all do it. We're all hardy. We can do it. But um, it would certainly be nice if we could access those first lines of care easier. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and I think, I think through the strategic clinical network, we're trying to uh, enhance those options regardless of where an Albertan lives. Mm -hmm. And one of the challenges, you know, we live in a, in a big city, but, you know, there, there are people living in remote and rural areas that also have even greater tr transportation mm -hmm. challenges mm -hmm. that we have to recognize should be part of the program. And so that's something definitely to work on. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go back online. We still have a lot of questions coming in. Um, so one, are we more prone to meniscal tears with age? And as a follow-up, maybe, are there any good options to help if you know your meniscus is worn away in the knees? Well, I can uh, take that first uh, question. You know, if you look at, um, say, people over the age of 45, I think the statistics would say suggest about 45% of those people have osteoarthritis. Pardon me, 30% of people over 45 years would have osteoarthritis of the knee visible if you did an x-ray only half of those people would be symptomatic. So I think the fact that osteoarthritis is more common as we age would increase your chance of meniscal tears. I think it's mm -hmm. also important to know that not all meniscal tears are problematic. So 
I know someone who has a meniscal tear who um, it doesn't cause them any problems and so they haven't had anything done to, uh, to, to manage that. The second part might be better answered by Jason, I think. Um, you have to repeat it, sorry. Yes, I'm so sorry. enthralled by your answer there. <laughs> <laughs> so if the meniscus is worn away in the knee, what oh. are some, some good yeah. options? And that yeah. may also go to Jackie for exercise mm -hmm. pieces mm -hmm. as yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, there are some procedures in the very young uh, who still have intact articular cartilage where they could have a, a transplant of the meniscus, but that's a very rare situation. In the vast majority uh, of, of cases when the uh, meniscus is affected um, and it goes on and it's accompanied with osteoarthritis, then it's, it's treated as part of the osteoarthritis treatment. When we do a knee replacement, we, re of course, remove all of those diseased tissues, including some of the, some of the diseased cartilage and the, the menisci when we carry out the procedure. And then another Do follow up on that, maybe. I think it was Dr. Walker mentioned that arthroscopic debridement of OA in the knee is not really recommended anymore. And one of the viewers wondering why that's the case. Yeah, there's many studies uh, that have now shown that um, the risks of surgery uh, don't, you know, outweigh uh, the benefits of surgery. And so a lot of patients may find symptomatic benefit or relief of pain for a short period of time, but within usually a year, they're back for another treatment, and usually that's a progression to a joint replacement. Um, if, there are if a patient has in intact articular cartilage and there's a mechanical or uh, a catching in the knee, then occasionally an arthroscopy in the face of arthritis, depending on the patient's age, mm -hmm. could be indicated. But um, we've really changed practice, and I've been in practice for 22 years. I've definitely noticed that arthroscopy used to be one of the treatments we offered to patients who were um, you know, um, reaching middle age and have symptoms. But a lot of those patients, in hindsight, came back for a joint replacement mm -hmm. shortly after. And now our practice has changed where we don't really offer it uh, as part of the treatment protocol unless uh, there's other factors like a very young age and mechanical symptoms, and we want to delay the joint replacement. Mm. Otherwise known as the scope. The scope. The scope. The scope. Dr. Walker, did you want to follow up on that? Well, one thing I was going to mention is, is you know, I, I gave examples and around the guidelines that when MRI isn't typically indicated in someone with, with osteoarthritis, moderate to severe osteoarthritis, but if you look at, if you think back to one of those images of the person that had severe medial compartment osteoarthritis, there are Dr. Worley's colleagues, and, and Jason might do it as well, that will just replace part of a knee, or so it's called a, a unicondylar implant. And in those situations, an MRI is absolutely indicated because you want to know what the cartilage is like is in the other compartment of the knee to make sure that that is healthy before you offer them mm -hmm. a partial knee replacement. You also want to make sure that the anterior cruciate ligament is intact, which will be important for that surgery. And there's another surgical procedure that is sometimes done. It's called a high tibial osteotomy, where they'll take a wedge out of the tibia and redistribute the weight from the medial side of the knee to the lateral side of the knee. Obviously, again, you don't want to do that unless you know that lateral side is healthy. So there are reasons for doing knee MRI in patients with osteoarthritis. But in general, and as, I, as that one caption said, it is unlikely to be required in the setting of osteoarthritis. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and move a little on to supplementation and joint health, perhaps a bit of a provocative one. Um, any thoughts or recent research around CBD oil as an effective anti-inflammatory? Oh, don't look I'm at me. So there, there are some actually there actually there are ongoing trials looking at whether um, it has some benefit. My understanding of the initial uh, initial data is um, it's limited benefit, but um, you know more to come on that. And then what about some other supplements? I mean, if you walk down the aisle in the grocery store, you're going to see a whole bunch of bone and joint health um, supplements, collagen, glucosamine, those sorts of things. Is there much evidence supporting those for um, being beneficial to joint health? There's some uh, large trials from the National Institute of Health out of uh, the U.S. that have looked at uh, the use of chondroitin and glucosamine and came up with uh, the results that really it's no better than placebo. There's some suggested benefit with chondroitin sulfate that it has a slight anti-inflammatory effect, but um, I, I think the, the, the research really doesn't support that. Now, does it do harm? It doesn't do harm other than to your pocketbook. So um, it doesn't interact with other medications. Uh, it's probably safe to take, but there probably is a placebo effect if you're taking it. 
maybe the real benefit comes from just getting up, walking to the grocery store, yes. buying yeah. it, and yeah. then walking yes. home. <laughs> exercise, exercise, exercise. Yeah. So maybe it's okay if you yeah. walk to buy it. Walk to buy it. So on that note, then, one more from the online before we go back to the room. Um, around exercise, and I know dear to Jackie's heart, prevention of injury. So how can I prevent injuries while participating in sports? What stretches or exercises can strengthen the knee? And is there um, a use for things like neoprene braces um, to help either prevent or give some stability after injury? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take the first one, injury prevention. There is an incredible amount of evidence out there to suggest that, that injury prevention programs, specifically sport injury prevention programs, that are typically administered as warm-up programs are incredibly effective in reducing the number of knee injuries that we see in young people. And there's great work happening here at the University of Alberta uh, that's led by a colleague of ours, Dr. Carolyn Emery, for years that, have, that has looked at this. And it, without a doubt, it's, it's, it's very effective. And depending on the sport you do, there's little differences in the nuances of the exercises you use. There's a great app, it's called Get Set and it was put out by the IOC, and it summarizes um, sort of the key injury prevention type exercises for a variety of different sports, so that's a, a great resource. Um, what was the second part of the question, Terry? It was... Bracing. Yeah, so bracing's an interesting thing. I'm certainly not aware of any evidence to suggest that if you wear a brace, you're less likely to hurt your knee. Um, it's probably more of a conversation in ankles. Um, ankle braces are used a lot sort of prophylactically in jumping sports like volleyball, basketball, etc. And there really isn't great evidence to suggest one way or the other. And we will often say to the athlete, you do what feels most comfortable to you. And if you feel safer and you can move better and feel more confident with the brace on, then that's fine. There's certainly no evidence that they're bad other than maybe they cost a little bit of money. Um, as far as wearing a brace after you've injured your knee, I think it really depends on the injury we're talking about and the management. We've actually currently, uh, recently just done a very large, what we call a systematic review, where we go out and try to look at all the evidence out there on a particular topic and synthesize it. And in particular for ACL injuries, what we've seen is there's no effective benefit in using a brace after you've had an ACL injury. But don't tell that to somebody who's tor torn their ACL and maybe had it reconstructed and is now playing sports and actually feels a lot of benefit and, and have much more confidence in themselves moving with the brace on. So although there's no evidence to suggest the outcomes are better, that doesn't mean that there might not still be a place for it. So I think we still need to figure out what braces are doing and whether or not they're helpful. Some people find them very helpful. And, other, and like I said, if you, if you synthesize all the evidence together, Mm. it would suggest they're probably not that helpful and to go and spend a thousand two thousand dollars on a brace um, mm. you know it's a lot a lot of cash for something that may or may not be effective mm. interesting and that was get set right get, get set get set yep. app yep okay I'm just I wrote that down uh, yep. uh, yes okay yes right middle of yes there we go yeah thank you Hi. Yeah, for hi. osteoarthritis of large joints, is there any benefit in using platelet-rich plasma as an uh, intraarticular injection? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there's a lot of people offering it. The science, um, I'd, I'd say, is not there to recommend it for osteoarthritis of the hip or the knee. There are some randomized trials in the benefit in soft tissue, such as rotator cuff of the shoulder. But um, even though it's uh, offered as a treatment, um, um, really, probably most situations, it's a placebo effect that's having the benefit. Hi. Uh, I must say it's amazing to have so much expertise in one room. I want to thank everybody for being here today. I have two questions, perhaps a thousand questions, but two I'll try to keep to. One is related to Dr. Whitaker. That is, you mentioned that exercise is good so long as the pain is less than five out of 10, I believe. Is there a potential for a feedback loop, however, that pain causes more inflammation, which then causes more pain and so on? And is it better to have perhaps some sort of medication or even an instead of something to re reduce that pain while exercising. 
Yeah, so it's a fabulous question. And, you know, the way that we talk about pain with our patients isn't actually that it's a bad thing. It's your body communicating with you. And that's assuming that you don't have um, sort of a hypersensitivity in pain or a central, we call a central sensitization with pain, where you actually can't rely on what it's telling you as much. But for most of us, our pain is actually a really important message. And so, you know, you can exercise, and you know, five sort of an arbitrary number, isn't it? And it's gonna be different for different people. But the message is, if you have pain, and it's not too much, and it's not limiting you too much, and you wouldn't probably rank it more as a five out of 10, if you do that exercise, and you don't go above a five out of 10, so that might mean you don't do it for quite as long as you wanted to, or as hard as you wanted to, and then you leave it, and then you come back to it again, and maybe you don't go as far as you want, and then you leave it. Over time, you're gonna find your pain level is lower, and you're able to do more without pain. So the pain in that way is a really great way of your body communicating to you sort of where a threshold is that you don't wanna go over. If you go over that threshold, you're absolutely right. You might start to see more inflammation in the joint, and you might start to have problems. But that in and of itself isn't necessarily always a problem either. That's you just figuring out. You remember I talked about trial and error. So the point is some days you might do too much and you might kind of flare your knee up and it might get a little bit swollen. That's not great, but you learned from that and you learned where that threshold was. And so the next time you go out, you try to do less than that. And then you go, okay, yeah, well, that wasn't bad, and I can do a lot of that, but now I don't feel like I'm doing very much, so I need to do a little bit more. And you gotta play around till you find that threshold. And part of finding the threshold is you might go over it sometimes. And as long as you listen to your body when you go over it and you don't do, you know, kind of push through it for, you know, a huge amount of time, you're probably not gonna do a massive amount of damage or harm, but you are gonna figure out kind of what that fine line is. So I really talk about pain being an important message from your body and, gui and a guide for what you can do from an exercise intensity piece. Thank you. Second question I had was for Dr. Reimer. The, have you looked at types of bacteria that are de very difficult to remove from the gut? And specifically bacteria that might be able to form a hyphal type of arrangement that invades the gut lining and is therefore very difficult to remove. And I'm thinking of specifically something like yeast. Uh, and if that's the case, then this can cause an allergy. And I haven't heard anybody talking about allergies today, but it reverts back to diet, because if you initially develop allergies to certain foods, then it may be difficult to create a diet which is uh, effective and according to the diet that you recommend. But have you done any research on that type of bacteria and specifically the type of bacteria that can cause oh, a food craving, I guess you might call it? Sugar so, at the end of that, yes. Okay, so a uh, couple things there. So. The microbiome is actually composed of bacteria, virus, fungi, which includes that yeast. So it's all of these microorganisms together. And so far, what the research understands the best is the bacterial component. There are some excellent uh, researchers at the University of Calgary working on the yeast aspect, but that's very new. And some of their initial work is showing that some of these yeast might actually be related to, say, an in infancy, causing allergies or asthma. So that, that's new, and we don't really understand how all of these different microbes or microorganisms live together in this community and how they interact and might affect each other. So um, that's what we're starting to understand about maybe some of these yeast. And then the other part was, are there some bacteria that are harder to get rid of? Um, so there probably are. I, I can talk about some that some bacterial families are known to be very much associated with inflammation, so cause inflammation in the gut, which then can cause inflammation in other parts of the body. So again, th there's no current understanding of how can we directly target them uh, to you don't necessarily want to completely rid the body of them because it's a community and you need this full community of microbes that we've seen to be healthy. So if, 
you don't have, we, we call it diversity. So if you don't have diversity in that community of these microorganisms, that's when we often see disease arising uh, in individuals. So yes, we would like to be able to get rid of some of those bad players, um, particularly the ones that are uh, causing more inflammation, but I don't think the, the science is there yet to say this is what you need to do to, to knock those down. Yeah. Now we're just uh, closing in on 11.45, and so just, I know we'd love to keep chatting and asking lots of questions, but just in the interest of time, we'll just ask one more question if we could, and I guess we'll take that from the house. Well, I'd like to thank you for the information. Today was wonderful. Maybe as a conclusion, in regarding my own personal knee injury, which was an ACL and an MCL tear while biking, at 67 years of age, my first sports injury, my daughter said. So I'm, I was quite positively impressed. But one thing that stunned me was the psychological impact. The fear of falling and going down a hill with debris as I continued to hike and do the things that I love was absolutely daunting. So if I join one of your, or hit on one of your websites, I would really like, I know it's a psychological um, aspect, but I would like it confirmed that I'm not going crazy, that when I couldn't sit down on a log and cried because I couldn't fold my leg under me, I was normal and it was a process. Yeah, so... I have a comment on Well, things. but I, I think we should validate your comment in the, in the sense that what you're describing is incredibly common. And if you look at the ACL tear literature, and a lot of it is, you know, 15 years to 25 years of age, young people playing sports, but yours is a, is a, is a, is a very similar example. This lack of confidence is, um, it's, a, it's a key component to the way that this injury presents. And it's actually building that confidence back up and the self-efficacy to do activities that often stops people from being active. It, it isn't, people don't stop playing their sport necessarily because um, they can't physically do it, but they lack confidence or they're worried about re-injury. And so whether we talk about rehab, whether we talk about surgery, the follow-up to that has got to be working with people to move to build their confidence back. So you're not crazy. I think what the experience you had was, is very valid. What might be unique to it is just that you had it at an age where maybe it isn't discussed as much because people don't tear their, their ACLs a ton when they're over 30 years of age, but it certainly happens. I have a, a good colleague who tore her ACL skiing just a, a couple years ago in her 50s. Um, so what you're experiencing is, is very valid. And, and I do think that if you look at a lot of the ACL rehab and the ACL literature, you will see that this, this psychological piece around confidence is very, very prominent. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Dr. Whitaker. Thank you to all of our panel of experts. I think a huge round of applause. <laughs> um, they say that you know, knowledge is power, and I certainly myself, I feel truly grateful because I feel really empowered with all the knowledge that you have provided with us today. So on behalf of those of us here and those of us at home, thank you again so much, and thank you especially to Dr. Donna Wood and your family for the Wood Joint Research Fund to keep these programs going and to allow us to have these truly impactful, impactful public events that connect us to these incredible minds, <laughs> these incredible healthcare professionals. So thank you again. Now, if you enjoyed this event and would like to see more contact from us, content from us, please stay in touch with us on social media. There we go. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And as Dr. Worley mentioned earlier in our program, feedback is so incredibly important. You will receive an online survey in the next few days about this event for our evaluation purposes so we can go forward and continue to expand and improve. Please take the time to complete it. It will really help us to make the best decisions for this event in the future. And also, if you haven't already, 
We invite you to visit our community partners at their information booths uh, that are up in the lobby area. That includes the formal part of our Wood Forum program. Thank you so much for coming. Please mark your calendars and join us next fall for the Wood Forum 2023 Healthy Bones for Life. Subscribe to the McKaig newsletter by scanning the QR code on screen and be among the first to hear our finalized 2023 date. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. And might you consider, on behalf of Dr. Reimer, a fiber-rich lunch. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a great day. <laughs>